Oh, there is no sound. There it is. Hey, oh, whoa, 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 there I am. There I am. There I am. They're probably hearing the music, but not me. Sorry, guys. <laughs> I had us muted because Aaron and I don't stop talking in the background before we start. <laughs> hey, everyone. Welcome. Uh, my name is Jeff, also known as the Revit Kid. What you missed me say was just that this is episode 59 of BIM After Dark Live. Thanks for joining us. Uh, this is a weekly live stream where we talk about Revit BIM and all kinds of things adjacent. Sometimes it's me, sometimes it's guests like tonight. Uh, the topic tonight is uh, the always debated um, um, groups versus links in Revit. So uh, I'm sure, I'm sure that whatever we talk about tonight will continue the debate on Twitter afterwards. But uh, I think you guys are going to be super interested to hear our intake, especially uh, our input, especially uh, uh, my guest Aaron's input on this uh, um, never ending question. I feel like I've been blogging about Revit for 12 years now. And I think every every year I get at least three or four times an email about this question today. So maybe now I can just point to this episode and say, here's your answer. <laughs> so before we jump into um, uh, the tip of the week, I did want to introduce my guest. You guys know him. He's been on the show. Oh boy, I don't even know. I meant to count before we jumped on, Aaron, but I I, I didn't count. Um, but <laughs> I, I didn't either. I should have. Before it was Bim After Dark Live, you were on a couple times, and then when it was Bim After Dark Live, you've been on at least three or four times. So welcome back, Aaron Mahler. How's it going? Great man? to be here. Thanks for having me. <laughs> of course. Uh, before we jump in, if folks uh, who are here live with us don't know who you are, maybe uh, give a brief little bio on who you are, what you do, and why you're on this little show with me. Yeah, absolutely. My name is Aaron Maller. Uh, I run a small group, a uh, BIM consultancy called Parallax Team. Uh, we are five and a half people uh, that all come from architecture, landscape architecture, construction tech, uh, software development. Uh, we're all still passionate about delivering projects. Uh, my background is in architecture. I went to school in New York uh, and uh, had to deliver shopping malls back when that was a thing, uh, which was uh, ironically some of my first projects in Revit were multi-phase, multi-million square feet. So the links and groups thing has come up a lot in the past uh, 15 years for me. Awesome. Um, I wanted to remind everyone as well that this is live if you're here tonight, 9 p.m. Uh, to ask questions, comment. I'm sure we're going to be checking out the chat along the way, and I'm sure there's going to be lots of input and heckling going on. So we will uh, we'll keep an eye on that as we jump into the content. But before we do jump into um, uh, Aaron's content, um, I did want to, uh, of course, do our Big Bad Bim tip of the week. So let's roll that, roll that sound, roll the music. Here we go. Um, so those of you that don't know what the BIM, Big Bad BIM Tip of the Week is, it's a little segment that I started here, sponsored by Enscape, where you send me a tip, and if I choose your tip to share here on the show, uh, I will send you a free t-shirt. So, uh, awesome. Our tip this week is from James, and uh, it has to do, believe it or not, with slab edges. So... I'm going to pull it up real quick. James, thank you for sending in the tip. Um, those of you who don't know what a slab edge is, um, it's it's just an object in Revit uh, that kind of acts like uh, a fascia, if you're familiar with that. Um, but it, it allows you to add what you would think, a, a slab edge. So I'm drawing it here. Um, it's a thickened slab edge, right? So anyone who hasn't done it before, it's under floor, you add it. This is what it looks like. Well, the tip from James is a great one, which is, did you know that you can host slab edges to model lines? So here I am hosting a slab edge to a model line. And I know you're thinking probably, why would I want to do that? Well, I know a lot of people who use slab edges uh, to do things like cornices and wall sweeps and sort of interior details. It's one way you can use them um, because as you may know, wall sweeps can be a pain in the butt. And so by doing that, guess what? You can create a slab edge type that's actually crown molding, right? And you can now loop that around instead of having to do a slab edge and offset it from your floor. Not only that, but you can also take your model lines and you can host them or lock them, I should say, to let's say a ceiling because you can't you can't sweep around a ceiling with anything and you can actually add a slab edge to the ceiling. And now you've got yourself a crown molding attached to our ceiling element that will modify with the ceiling element. So kind of cool, cool tip, something that um, a lot of people don't know about. And so James, thank you for sending that tip in. I appreciate it. Oops, I just clicked the wrong button there. Where's everyone? You just saw my son's face. I lost you, Aaron. Hold on a second. 
I'm still here. There We're we watching your Revit screen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a little delay there. So James, thank uh, you. That's for, true. Thank that's you true. for the tip. I appreciate it. Um, thank you, Enscape, for sponsoring the segment. For those of you uh, interested in checking out Enscape, head on over to enscape.bamafterdark.com, and you will actually save 10% off a um, a uh, subscription to Enscape. So uh enscape.bimafterdark.com thanks a lot guys uh and thanks james so if you guys got tips feel free to send them off kind of cool uh did you know that aaron um i did but it's always awesome and exciting to hear that other people are using it as well because uh you know a lot of folks have looked at me as crazy when i've recommended <laughs> hosting things to model lines so i'm loving that somebody else is doing it uh um, that's, awesome. that's awesome now no i actually if when when you recommend that, are you are you locking model lines to elements like I was just, like I was suggesting, or not not necessarily? You like to treat them separate. Uh, so it, this goes down like a rabbit hole. I'm, I'm generally <laughs> against the locking, uh, just because of the sheer size and number of elements in a lot of the projects that I work in. Once things start to get locked, everything starts to grind into a halt. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also interesting. I mean, this is this is another whole episode. But I mean, some of the differences between slab edges and what roof faces are allowed to do is mm. quite intriguing. So um, mm. there's a whole conversation there. People get frustrated in my Revit training class because I'm like, model everything is roofs, <laughs> and it's totally true. Um, did a project recently uh, where the ceilings are all roofs. No joke, because then you can do crown moldings out of like roof faces mm. and not need the lines. But I love using the lines. The lines mm -hmm. are great. That's a great point. And, and actually, anyone who's interested, I'll post a link to it. But um, Aaron's episode, I think it was not filters. It was was it filters or was it the template one? I think it was might have been the template. Uh, might have been the template one, but it could have been the filter one. Either one. We, we <laughs> talked a little bit about how, uh, you know, using just because Revit decided to categorize something as something doesn't mean that you necessarily have to use it for that reason. It's kind of the kind of the idea there. There's ways around it other than definitely. just using the category, right? So category awesome. reprisals, definitely. <laughs> yes. Yep. We got a lot of a lot of people in the chat. We got James Van is here. Hey James, what's up, man? Wow. Um I don't I don't know if that actually I didn't know what, what James it was. That'd be really funny if it was James Van, but <laughs> uh Jim Balding's here. How's it going? Jason, awesome guys. Cool, cool, cool. Uh all right. I need to catch up on your pie. Awesome. All right. So let's do this, man. I think, let's do I think, it. I think, I think let's we're do ready. It. I think we're ready. I think we're ready to start. We got like a hundred people here ready to figure out nice. what nice. Aaron Mahler thinks about links versus groups. <laughs> and I can't wait to hear it either. <laughs> Should we give them the cliffs notes and give them the answer on slide one? No. We don't ah, no, no. Uh, we got to had some suspense. They, they get Come the on. answer. They get the answer by Come slide on. six. I got to uh, at least finish my drink before we get to the answer. <laughs> totally. Totally. Okay. So yeah, we'll jump in. Uh, here's the cool thing. I got a whole bunch of fun stuff open. I hope it's fun to look at. Um, we're not going to do a whole a lot of PowerPoint, but unfortunately there's a lot of talking points in this topic. So I thought I'd just throw a couple slides together. What's really weird is like whenever somebody, and we get yeah, at Parallax, at least we get questions all the time about links versus groups. And the trouble is people ask the question links versus groups as if it's a unilateral one answer thing for every building typology and every situation. So we have to first address like what the actual question is that we're asking about. And so I'm going to use multifamily, you know, for today's talk, uh, because a lot of our clients do multifamily, but it also applies to healthcare. It also applies to other building typologies. We're really just talking about repetitious units. But the question is, is it basically a larger building where there is only one sub element? So in this case, you're talking about like multifamily with apartments, right? The apartment mm -hmm. is the sub element. Then there's other types of projects where, you know, if it's multifamily, it's garden style, but it might be hospitality, it might be a resort, there might be townhouses. And then you're talking about the entire building is the repetitious element. And then there might still be a sub repetitious element below. And so the reason I just like to say, you can't really say like links or groups definitively, because in this garden style example, which one are you talking about? The building that's repeating or the apartment that's repeating in the building that's repeating? Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? So. I always like to bring that up before we jump into like, what is what I would say the answer. <laughs> then there is one other kind of problem. And that is a lot of my clients get frustrated when I ask this, but the moment they're like, should we use links or groups? And I'm like, well, let's talk about how your project has to get submitted. Mm. Uh, and, and the reason for this, we're not going to talk about all four of these right away, but some of these are what I call automatic decision makers, right? Mm -hmm. So, but you've got a building where it's one giant set of drawings and that's cool. Then you've got option two, which is like, it's one giant set of drawings, but each building has its own distinct plans. Like the, the plan sheets do not overlap. Building two is its own plan. That's cool. 
because I come from a shopping mall background, there is then also like projects where there's like six buildings, but they're not broken up plan by plan. They're still broken up on like a grid because it's all common space and kiosks and stuff in the middle. And so in that case, you know, the third one that we're looking at here, the situation's a little different. And the last one is kind of interesting to me because that's when clients come up and they say, yeah, it's five buildings on a site, but each building is gets submitted as its own permit. Mm -hmm. So in that situation, you're not really talking about the same thing. Oh, that's right. I did this little thing here, just showing the same. Uh, yeah, we'll just skip through that. No one likes PowerPoint. <laughs> so the first and the last one are really the same thing because the moment somebody says we have five buildings, but they're all going in for permits separately. I'm like, they are all their own project. Like if you want to have a site model and link them all together just for rendering, that's cool. Mm -hmm. But if you're getting five permits, you've got five sets of revisions. You've got a track. You've got five project numbers. Essentially, you've got five versions of the thing on top. So at that point, it's like, Everyone is its own file. Mm -hmm. The only reason I'm going to throw that out there is because for me, like the moment you need a different drawing set, all the front end and back end stuff that's in our template, like the legends, the cover sheets, the schedules, all that stuff, I don't want to spend the time to duplicate that. So if there's different permits, I want every building in its own file personally. Mm -hmm. So, but at that, at that point, we're just talking about the building type sub element being the link. And then there's still these apartments that are what I'm going to call the main repetitious unit. Um, and surprise, surprise, I mean, if you didn't know this already, for those of you who have talked to me, what we use for the smaller repetitious units is always going to be model groups. It's not going to be file links. We're going to get into why, um, but before we do that, um, I want to list out the pros and cons. And this is an exhausting two slides because it's just a ton of text and nobody likes that. But let's just go through what are the cool things about groups and then the crummy things about groups? We'll do the same for links. And then I'm going to actually open some Revit models to show you guys a few things. So groups, yeah, it's nice that they're all in one file. When you're opening or reloading a linked file, you don't have a bunch of dimensions that are vanishing. And then you get stuck in the daisy chain of sync with central and reload because somebody else deleted a dimension and all that kind of good stuff. So it's nice when groups are all in one file. So as somebody who likes working with contractors and subcontractors a lot, what's a really big deal to me is that when things are in model groups, they are still all discrete elements. So if you have an apartment type A and you have 50 instances of a link in there, sure, there can still be 50 instances in Navisworks, but whenever you're looking at the data from that model, there aren't really 50 of those things. I mean, there's 50 if you compound the schedule from all the links, but it's annoying and you can't actually give them all discrete identity data unless you do it in a third party software. So for me, that's kind of a miserable non-starter. That's why I like the groups. Another one is how you actually annotate in groups. And what I like about that is it's all in one file. So we're going to talk a decent amount about links and the different ways you can annotate through them. Cliff's notes, it all sucks. None of it's good. If you've got to annotate a linked file from your file, just your life is pretty much miserable. And that's kind of, it just is what it is. Uh, the other thing I like about groups is they're fast. Like if you want to duplicate a group or make a new group, you can just, you know, edit type duplicate, you can blow it away and create a new group. Um, what I thought was going to be really cool when they made the feature was this thing called excluding elements, but I put it in quotes because it's awful. So no one should ever do it. And unfortunately Revit does it by itself, which is just, that's a, we'll put that in the cons column. I think I forgot to put it in. Um, and again, what I really like about when you've got a whole file that's just full of model groups is when you want to export it to Navisworks or any third-party downstream software, it's super efficient because it's already in one model and everything's good to go. Okay, so what sucks about groups? And the answer is a lot, right? Mm -hmm. So these are all in air quotes because these are all just things that we've heard over the years. Like groups can't be mirrored or they shouldn't be mirrored and they shouldn't be rotated. And I can't tell you how many times I read on Reddit, like if you put groups in groups, you're bad. And I'm like, all right, it's cool, I'm bad. <laughs> I think that's, uh, I think that's, uh, yeah, anyways. And then I hear that groups are lousy for performance. Like they slow down models. They, they make models huge. They cause corruptions. Uh, and th this is not an air quotes because it is true. If you work in the API groups do suck. <laughs> yes. John and I go back and forth about this all the time because like I, I use a ton of model groups and the API is just like a kick in the nuts when you want to work with groups. Cause like half of it's not there. So that's kind of rough. Um, and yeah, obviously we're going to, the fixed group thing, it stinks. None of us like it. You go to finish a group. It tells you it's going to break a bunch of stuff. Your day is ruined. That's, mm -hmm. that is a reality. So we'll leave that one out there. Um, the last one we're going to mention, I think it's the last one. There might be one below it. Varying floor to floor heights sucks with groups mm -hmm. because the only way you can do it is to attach the walls to other elements, which is very scary because it will let you do it. Um, we're not, we're not really going to hold this against groups because the same con exists in links as well. So we'll come back to that, uh, in just a couple of minutes.
By the way, I do see a cool question from, from Mitchell in the chat about where do nested and super families fit into the group's mm. links debate. Um, I will get to that. And I, I don't have a slide for it, but I'm going to bring that up in a few minutes because that's an awesome question. So, so before, um, before we move on, I did want to unpack a couple of those things that I think are, are important totally that I, I don't totally. think I don't think a lot of people think about or realize and the 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 um, the idea that groups have their own distinct elements versus the links is a huge one. Um, and maybe it's because, you know, we're coming at it from also downstream use of models. But but, you know, the the reality of, of those elements having their own unique identifier and, and data is huge, right? As Absolutely. To, especially if, if, if you, you know, and I think more of us, even on the design side, uh, are using other third party tools down the road of, of their models. Sure. And, and that's the kind of stuff that will burn you <laughs> if, 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 if you don't realize it. And so I think that's a great one. Um, and then so, so and then as far as the cons in quotes, so I'm curious because I'm, su I'm sure some people may ask it, but um, uh, are you suggesting these are myths or do you have uh, do you have experience that these are truth in the in the cons? Oh, so for example, you have uh, <laughs> you have two you have two slides to go, my friend. You okay, can't ask right, that question. I'll let, him go, I'll let him go. I'll let it go. All right. All right ask. But uh, I, no, didn't awesome. I didn't want to stop and reiterate the 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 that the model data part, because I think that is a big deal. Um, you know, I work on a lot of healthcare work and, and yep. different design teams will work different ways. And a lot of one, a lot of them will use links. And that's one of the things we found out, you know, that that can be a little bit of a pain in the butt is that if you use a room type C for the patient rooms mm -hmm. and then it's duplicated 400 times, that room type C as a link, it's the same elements every all yeah. 400 times. And that can be a little tricky down the road, depending on what you're using the model for, for sure. So, so yeah, this came up as early as 2007 for me. I'm one of the first models that we did where, uh, I mean, in 07, we weren't giving the model to the owner, but there were people who wanted the model downstream. And the way I approach it now is as we get farther into this discussion, you'll find out that for the kind of work that we do, links are an absolute non-starter. And as an example, let's say we represent a building owner or a developer and they want a model for FM. Well, to your point, Jeff, if you've got 500 copies of link room type D, mm -hmm. they all basically share a lot of identity data. Now, the solution a lot of people come up with is, okay, right before we turn it over for, for FM, we'll bind all those mm -hmm. links. And then now they're not this, <laughs> but, but now they're not the same elements that they were when they were in 3D coordination and asset tracking. They've gotten completely they've got new, new element IDs. New element they're, they've IDs, got brand so. new everything. So it's completely a non-starter for me. But yeah, we're going to come back to that. Just so yep. you know, there is a slide where we're going to look at both sets of cons and talk about what's real and what's not. Got it. So awesome. the ones in quotes, we're coming back to those. Awesome. Awesome. <clears throat> DH Design said, I wish both of you were at Autodesk University this week. I don't know where he went, but I think it's virtually, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I was. You want, I, I, anyone anyone I, wants uh, to hang out with us, you could just, you know, I, DM me on Twitter and we'll Zoom call. Yeah, I, I, Otherwise, I, we're not going to be at the bar drinking because there is no bar. Totally. Right totally. I, I sat on a great panel with Pervy, who's who's hanging out in the in the chat. And uh, yeah, I wish I was at AU too. I, I, I actually missed the sadistic hotel walk. Like, I, I do. I miss it. Um, but OK, let's jump into the same slide. Oh, I did forget a couple. All right. So these are real as well. When you've got groups and you've got to reload a family that's in like every group in the project, it sucks. Mm. And there are work sharing complications as well. And we'll talk about those in a few minutes. Mm. And just to wrap that up, when you have multiple files that have the same groups in them, it is doable, but it is complicated. And so we'll come back to that in a few minutes. Um, but let's jump into the same slide for links now, right? And, and I want to be clear about this because when you write the pros and cons out, links do win. Uh, and I admit that. And I'm also going to be clear about the fact that I have done projects with both groups and links. And I tried it with links first because coming from an AutoCAD background, that was the language I was used to, like X Revit to the hilt, you know? And <laughs> so anyways, uh, links, you know, the, the pros of links is they should be super lightweight in theory because those elements aren't really there. And since it's a copy and it's a reference, oh my gosh, it should be super lightweight in theory, right? So uh, it doesn't break, uh, and this is a real benefit, right? You don't get the fixed group garbage all the time, which is awesome. You know, the individual rooms will not explode. Uh, reloading families and types pretty stable. So that's cool. Uh, there aren't work sharing complications the way there are with groups, and that is a real benefit that links get. Um, making them unique, I'm going to call this one a tie because opening a link and doing a save as just so you can relink it, that kind of sucks. I don't really like it, but it's stable. So, you know, your mileage may vary there. Um, how you document with links. I'm old. I've been using Revit a long time. So I was using Revit before by linked view even existed for sections and elevations. So mm -hmm. how you document with linked files, we'll talk about it in a few minutes. I'm not going to call it a pro, but it is nice for people who like it, uh, 
uh, because you do have the option where you want to do your documentation. Um, and this one, I'm going to throw it in there as something that's possible. And I naively made a project team do this once and I'll never do it again. But one interesting, one interesting thing about links as repetitive units is you can leverage design options in the linked file to make variations of units and not have to do a save as. Don't ever beep do it. It's just awful, <laughs> but you yeah, can do I it. Just, and, and I'll... Just, just reading that, I was just going like this. <laughs> just, <laughs> just, I, I've been there. I've tried it too. It is. Yeah, like... totally, totally. Okay, so so things that are bad about links. Obviously, you know, you've got multiple files. You have to move between them. Let's let's dispel one myth though. Uh, a lot of people think that to open a linked file, you have to unload it. That's completely not true. You have to unload it if you open the central file of the linked file. But if all your units are work shared, you can open a local of the unit and it will not make you unload it from your main model. Mm -hmm. So there's this like myth that like you have to unload them. And that's because people do it from the project browser, yep. which always opens the central. So mm -hmm. just an interesting thing. A big issue, uh, and I'll show you a handout, uh, and Jeff, I'll send you these handouts that you can, you can give out later if awesome. you want. But a big issue is like, how do you annotate linked files? I want to say it was 2012 or 2013 or 2014. We got the ability to tag and keynote through links. Uh, it was new at the time. Um, might have might have been earlier. I might be wrong. Might have been 09. Well, I, I know 2012 is when we were able to tag rooms through a link. Okay, so so it was I probably 2012. Very yeah. specifically, being on a project where we actually split it up and linked because we couldn't. The project was so big that we couldn't keep it one file. You know, back when when Revit, you know, had the memory limit and all that good stuff. And so, oh, yeah. and so it was huge. We actually upgraded the file because we were like, oh my God, we can actually tag things through our link. So maybe it was around there, the keynotes also, right. but I know for a fact that that was rooms and, mm -hmm. and some of the mm -hmm. other elements, wall tags and stuff like that. Yeah, totally. And so Jason in the, in the chat just asked like, what about on BIM360 where it doesn't let you open the local? Well, you just can't do it from the project browser. You can still do it. You just go to the homepage and open the unit like as a local file, right? Um, but yeah, but so back to the annotating thing, um, you can tag or keynote through the link. What's scary about that is then on file open, you've got all the stuff getting blown away. The tags get orphaned. The keynotes are throwing up errors, all that kind of stuff. The old school way, like pre 2012 was by linked view. So, you know, you went into VG, RVT link, custom by linked view, picked a view that was annotated in the linked file. And I'm going to reference an old AU handout that haunts me that I wrote back in 2011. And people keep emailing it to me and they're like, does this mean you like links? And I'm like, oh my God, it's a decade old. Give me a pass on this, William. <laughs> it's a horrible handout. I mean, it's, it, it was about how we did a project with links when we were doing them with links. And that right. was before we tried it with groups, right? So problem is once you write it and it's out there on the internet, it's just, it never dies. Oh, believe um, me, no. <laughs> yeah, right. And so the other issue, and, and this is, uh, so, you know, you have, what do you dimension to when you're working with links? Are you doing it all in the linked file? So you have to be committed to being completely in the link and everything is by linked view, or are you dimensioning in the host file two things in the link? For me, that's a dangerous proposition. Uh, even as recently as Revit 2021, we uncovered a bizarre issue recently where, no joke, if you dimension to a rectangular edge of an object in a linked file and then reload the link, it survives. If you do a radius or a diameter on a linked object, it automatically gets deleted when you reload the link. <laughs> so there's that. Uh, a few more cons and then we'll jump into cool stuff. It's a nuance. It's a nuance. It's, it's a nuance, right. So back to your point, if you have apartment type D or operating room D or triage room D or whatever, and you're linking them in, are you doing it as overlay versus attachment? Because let's be clear about what this question means. This question means who are you screwing and when? That's the whole thing. Overlay is what we really want to be doing because now our files lightweight when we send it, you know, the, the units aren't all really linked in. And oh my gosh, I sent the file to MEP and they have no units. <laughs> so what are they supposed to do now? They're supposed to manually link in all the units and go place them as well. That's the definition of what overlay is for, but it's brutal. Well, if you set all your units to attachment, now when your file is a link for structuring MEP, they have to keep a novel on their desk because when they're opening your model, it takes like 25 minutes. Mm -hmm. So that's somewhere where, you know, the links are just kind of brutal. Now there's a whole discussion that can be had about rooms and areas and spaces and what happens with bounding when you're using linked files as bounding elements and then you unlink the files temporarily. Um, 
I can't go too far down this rabbit hole, but there's some interesting data to suggest that, you know, when you unlink a core and shell model from an interior model, all the rooms suddenly become unbound. It generates like a thousand warnings. Now we all know that if you just relink the model again or reload the model, the bounding areas all get solved. The performance doesn't come back until you restart the model, until you close the model and open it again. Don't know why I have done some time tests related to this. The warnings do disappear, but the performance stays in that degre degraded until state close, rev it, reopen until you, until you at least close the model session, and go back it, in. Yeah. yeah. It's bizarre. Yeah. Uh, now to be fair, I haven't really tested that since like 2016, but I know it was like that in 2016. So, hmm. um, and then here's a really interesting question. And this is not meant to be a plug for guardian, uh, from Parley Burnett at iconic BIM, but it kind of is. So if you want to work in five files or 10 files, you want to have 10 apartment files and a, a building file, you know, it's not just about, you know, reloading content, like an app to do the reloading, who's checking to see which version of which content is in each, each apartment. So an example is a cabinet. So we have cabinets that have shared nested doors, shared nested hardware, all that kind of stuff, but also the cabinets themselves are type cataloged and you can change the size. So if there's a 30 by 24 in the building file, but I've changed 30 by 24, don't ask why I would do this, to have like an eight inch drawer instead of a six inch drawer, and that's now showing in a schedule, what if I didn't make that same change in all 10 of the units? Now I have conflicting families. And depending on where you're doing your documentation, again, are the unit plans all elevated in the unit files with the older version of the cabinet? And that applies for system families as well. Like, what if you've changed a wall type? What if you've changed a roof type? Mm -hmm. So this is tough because where groups are a little wild to interact with on a day-to-day -day basis, like with links, the question is, is somebody actually guaranteeing that every file that you have uses the exact same content? Because this is where architects like to tell me like, I am an architect, I will manage that. <laughs> I just tried to side eye an architect, but there wasn't one in the room. I'm not really sure what to do with that. Um, okay, we, we and so, <laughs> so back to the design option. I mean, thing. you did I mean, technically side eye an architect, right? I, I mean, you're I, looking at me. <laughs> th th there you go, there, there you go, go there depending you go. on where your Zoom is. So, and of course, yeah, so linked models also, this is tough because when you're in the building file and you're looking at apartments that are links, there isn't a project-wide global visibility state for any of those apartment links. So we forget this, just like a CAD import, Every view in a model, every link gets a different visibility state, which means what, what, how do you explain to a consultant what is the actual view of the building at any one time? Mm -hmm. And especially if you start messing with the design options, that'll just kill Phasing you. And design, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I, I've, it's said, totally I, I've said it once and I'll say it again. If to design teams who send us models as the contractor, uh, I don't care what you have in there. Primary is always what I'm using because I'm not sorting through your design options. So exactly, exactly. <laughs> if you whatever you want us to see, set it to primary because I'm not figuring that out. I'm sorry. Totally, totally. <laughs> by, by the way, some of these some of these comments are gold. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I was reading a few of them. So, and there's actually yeah, a, couple, so, a couple interesting group questions and issues that I think you'll probably. You'll probably have some great uh, demo on. on uh, cool. To, I'll go uh, fast because we're almost done with PowerPoint. I'll go fast and then we can get back to the questions. Yeah, but awesome. some of these are great. So, you know, Steve Goodmanson is talking about having like two sessions open. Steve, just to make you feel good, we have eight open right now in the background so we can show you some models. Um, but okay, so let's jump right <laughs> oh, in. Oh, is he talking about uh, to, to open links, having two sessions yeah, open? Yeah, to that, have yeah, two yeah, sessions yeah, open, yeah, which, is, yeah. which, which works. Yeah, it works. Um, <laughs> so, okay. So um, again, varying floor to floor height still sucks with links. Now, this is what I really want to talk about. It's, it's a big part of today's talk. Whenever I'm listing out pros and cons for links and groups, something that doesn't come up because we don't think about it, like on paper, this should not be a case. There is a massive disparity in performance of graphical regeneration when everything is links. Mm. I don't know why it is. Um, I, I'd love to talk to some people at the factory about it, but the, the, the gist of it is for whatever reason, the higher the number of links are in the view that needs to regenerate, just the slower it goes. Hmm. Um, so where this really gets to be interesting is any of you who have done a project where apartments are links, you know that there's the spin wheel of death if you try to cut a building section. And what happens is you start cutting the section and as you drag the line across, it just spin wheels and spin wheels and the cursor doesn't come back. So you're like trying to find the cursor so you can click the second end of the section and it's just spin wheeling and spin wheeling and spin wheeling that's because the units are links. Hmm. And there, there are some workarounds to dealing with it. So I, I worked with uh, somebody else in the BIM community who really wanted to do a project with links. And his answer was, well, if you just go in to manage links and unload all of the units, when you go to cut the section, then it works okay. 
And I'm like, that's, Ouch. yeah, that, <laughs> it works, I'm, sure. I'm like, you know, if I close the project and just draw it on that drafting table back there, <laughs> it works too. <laughs> um, so all the, yeah. So, I mean, it does work though. Like if you hide all the links or if they're not on, uh, sure. then cutting a section works, but, um, but, then, but then you're not counting in the amount of time to reload all the links after the fact. Re so reloading probably, all the links. You probably have the same amount of time to do both processes, right? But, so, so now follow that daisy chain. Uh, you've got to unload and reload all the links, all the work sharing errors that may pop mm -hmm. up because somebody else edited a link, any dimensions that got deleted because you reloaded the link. Like you've now got a plethora of things to deal with, which is just mm -hmm. miserable. Mm -hmm. um, so here's what we're going to do on this slide real quick. Uh, these are only the cons from both and they're color coded. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna talk about which things are real and which things are not, mm -hmm. okay? So things in green, not real problems, totally solvable. Mm. Things in orange are true, but not a huge ordeal depending on your tolerance for dealing with them. Now things in red are still solvable uh, but in my, and again, you know, this is solely my opinion, but these things are kind of deal breakers for me. Um, and so we're just going to talk about them real quick and then we'll jump into the models. Mm -hmm. So it'll probably blow a lot of people's minds maybe to understand that the whole shouldn't be mirrored, shouldn't be rotated and groups and groups are bad is all a misunderstanding about what the software wants you to do. It's, uh, and I'll show you, I'll show you where the misunderstanding comes from. And I'm actually, I want to give the Revit development and the QA team a solid because I did a presentation in Australia in 14 about these particular for me, I'm sure they knew about them, but mysteriously a few years ago, a number of those problems just completely went away. They were, they were solvable back then, but now they're just gone. And Melissa and I accidentally realized they had fixed it a couple of years ago. Um, nice. I think Melissa found it because we were goofing around with ceilings and light fixtures. So, okay, on the, uh, on, the, on the group side, we've got the things that are in orange that are true. Uh, groups make models large. That's 100% true. Mm -hmm. Here's something I think everybody should know, and people hear me say this a lot and they think I'm a zealot, but it is true that when models have problems, they get physically large. It is not true that just because a model is physically large, it has problems. So I've got four or five models open right now on this computer. Most of them are over a gigabyte in size for the single model we're gonna look at. The point is if you're building a model very well, but it just has tons of stuff in it, it'll get huge and that's all good, but it's okay. Doesn't now if your model, bad. doesn't mean right, bad. Right, right, right. Now if your model is bad because it's a one story building and it has 10,000 warnings in it, it's gonna be 500 megs and everybody's gonna be like, oh my God, 500 megs is Revit's limit and it dies and it's not really the case, right? <laughs> Um, now the, the damn fixed group thing, that's legit. It's a problem. It stinks. Um, it's solvable, but yeah, it does. It does kind of stink. Um, and so a couple of these other things for groups that we were looking at is like, you know, reloading families is tough. The work sharing complications are tough and a model that is built with groups because all the elements do really exist in the file. You will need a lot of Ram. That is a real thing. Mm -hmm. Um, how much RAM? I mean, we're not talking about a deal breaker here. Like my machine had 64. I only had one project that needed more than 64 and it was an edge case. That's, that's pretty mainstream right mm -hmm. now. Like, I mean, you can get by with 32 for a lot. Yeah. Um, but here is where the line in the sand really is for me. And that is, I want to talk about a couple of the cons of linked files, because the question is, where are you annotating? And I'm going to make it really simple. So here is our building. And then here is our apartment file, which we know lives over here. Mm -hmm. Now, the trouble is a lot of people get wishy-washy when you talk about, you know, annotations. So the question is really, let's assume you're in the apartment and you have to start dimensioning stuff to grid lines. Where does the dimension go? If it goes in the green file, you can't dimension to the grid lines because they're in the red file. Now let's assume you copy monitor them. Now let's, let's disregard for a second that that couldn't really happen because the unit exists hundreds of times in the building. Right, right. In different let's pretend, locations, right? <laughs> in, in different locations. But let's pretend it was possible, okay? What everybody forgets is that if you then dimension this and then you, refer, you, you, lo, you link it into here, this view in green does not see this grid. It sees this grid. 
Hmm. And that dimension will not automatically jump. It's not like some morphing thing, at which point this dimension is just gone. And this is where people get a little wishy-washy and they're like, well, I dimensioned most of my units in the unit file, but then I go back to the parent file and I put a few dimensions in there. And I'm like, this is how drawings end up looking like bags of trash because you can't go to one view and see the whole set of drawings. It's just hmm. a mess. So your other option is you can do bilinked view where now everything has to be dimensioned in here. And you can make that work again, if the grids are all there. And then you also commit that in this view, you're not showing these grids at all. And you're only showing the ones from the linked file. Right. Now you can't adjust any grid heads, the bubbles end where they end. Not awesome, right? Challenge. Uh, so John's in the comments saying links are better. Yes, I like John's imported SketchUp method. That was the best. <laughs> um, so again, uh, even though it seems kind of silly that annotations is really going to be one of the issues between the hardships of annotations and the massive issue that happens with view regeneration, to me, links are automatically going to be a non-starter. Um, the nail in the coffin for me is really that updating the content in the linked files becomes its own full-time job. You know, as we said before, system families and uh, and content alike. You know that if you try to do like a bulk reload or a bulk copy and paste, a lot of times Revit will say, "Hey, it's already loaded here. I'm going to just use the definition that's in the file already." That's like the opposite of what we're trying to do. So, this is going to make links kind of brutal. But I want to go back because obviously now you know that the answer for me is going to be groups are the way to go. Right. But I want to talk about all these things that aren't real problems that people think are. So we're going to bail on this PowerPoint now. Phew, enough of that. All right. Okay. <laughs> Here's my illustrious Revit 2014 that I had to dig out just for today. Um, all you get is the Revit sample file because Parallax didn't exist in 2014. <laughs> so I don't have squat. <laughs> now, what I want to show you here, uh, it's very real. We're going to make a group. I'm going to steal one of their chairs. We'll put some chairs and some corners here like this. Look at that. Two on the top right, two on the bottom, top right, bottom left. Yeah, I got that. We'll group it. And now we'll do basically all the stuff that people said we shouldn't do, right? So let's mirror this group. We'll make a copy. Let's mirror this group at an angle. We'll do that. That's fun. Let's, uh, whoops. Okay, let's do that. Hey, let's take these two and make them groups in groups. And then we'll copy that. And let's go edit one of the groups that's inside the group because we said we weren't going to do that either. And look, everything's okay. So where did this reputation come from that groups can't rotate, can't mirror, can't be inside other groups? The answer is sort of funny. They came from face-based families. So if we go back in and let's actually blow away our bigger groups because we don't need those at the moment. So we'll just get rid of all this stuff. We're going to go in here. We're going to edit this group. We're going to make this thing bigger, pretend it's like a real apartment or a room or something. We'll keep our three chairs in the corner. We'll keep our two chairs in the corner. And now we'll also add in our new face-based awesome upper cabinet. All right. So we've done this. We feel pretty good about ourselves. Now we start mirroring and things are fine. Whoops. I meant to keep the other one there. And then we copy one and then we rotate it 90 degrees and it's fine. So what's the issue here, right? So back when I worked at Beck Group, uh, there was an architect who worked there. Uh, her name was Monica, and she actually helped me realize what the issue was with groups because she was working on a, a, a hospital and I was working on an office building at the time. And I explained to her how to set up the groups. And every time she did it in a patient room, it broke. And every time I did it in my office building, it worked. And it became like a riddle. Uh, and so one of the handouts that I'll send to you uh, that you can share with everybody that you'd like is from that Australian class at RTC. And this is what I called, uh, well, I had, I had a really unflattering name for it, but this is basically the sample file where I just went crazy because I was being stubborn. And I said, we are going to find the reason that it's breaking for Monica and it's working for me because she must be doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, newsflash, she wasn't doing anything wrong. Um, if I were to give you a riddle, uh, I'll show you the answer real quick though. Hospitals, uh, I actually did it. Uh, yeah. So hospitals, when you're doing a foot wall, there's only one major piece of millwork on the wall, but when you start doing like offices where there's all kinds of cabinets and I had the explanation backwards, she was on the office. I was on the hospital. Mm -hmm. So I was only placing one object on a wall at the head wall and foot wall, and she was placing tons of cabinets. Mm -hmm. And so where that gets interesting is once there are two face-based objects on a wall, this is when stuff starts to hit the fan. 
<laughs> right? And this is what people are used to. Why did one of them flip backwards and why is the group now broken? Oh, well, groups must just stink. So, hey, let me copy this over here and let me say this group is going to rotate by 90 degrees. Oh my God, groups can't rotate. What is this crap, <laughs> right? By the way, little funny trivia about old Revit, groups can rotate as long as you don't try to do all 90 degrees <laughs> at once. <laughs> So I, I can't reproduce this success uh, in this little demo file because it might've been earlier than 14 that they fixed this. But back in the day, a lot of folks don't know this. You could actually get it to work if you just split the walls and had them all hosted to different walls. Hmm. So I don't think this is gonna work now because like I said, in 2014, it seems to still be uh, broken in a different way. But back when I did this in the sample file at Beck, yep, so that'll fix it. Mm -hmm. So we split the wall. So now the rule is one face-based family on one mm -hmm. face and the problem is gone. But here's the thing. If you didn't know this five years ago, you were like groups are the devil. That's it. You stay away. Right? <laughs> right. Exactly. So here's where it gets interesting. Not, not to mention when, actually, you know, splitting, if, if that was your solution, splitting walls around the entire thing would just be a nightmare too, right? <laughs> to totally. Which I want to be fair is not the solution, right? Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. th this, this was, this was the prescriptive, let's try to find the problem. Yeah. The real solution was just getting away from face-based families. So we, so again, I, I had this unique opportunity that I never wanted. Uh, when I started Parallax in 2016, it was like, let's build all my content from scratch again, because that was fun. Mm -hmm. And we just decided let's make all the upper cabinets not hosted. They still snap. We're not getting anything by using face-based families. Mm -hmm. Let's go back to unhosted. And lo and behold, now when people are doing entire apartment buildings with groups, eh, they've been open for four hours, watch them crash when I try to pull them into a Zoom meeting. It's going to be, it's going to be legit. So now you can have entire groups, all of the cabinets, all of the furniture, all of the, whatever, as long as it's not face based with multiple families associated to any particular surface, everything works fine. Um, they're mirrorable, they're rotatable, they're flippable. Uh, you can edit them. They, I mean, they work like absolute champs. Um, and we have a bunch of these that are open. And um, I do want to just give a shout out to, to two different groups because a lot of the times when I show images or screenshots and I tell folks like, yeah, this all works uh, perfectly with groups. So this is one large project. Um, and then we've got like three more of these open. Uh, and just to be clear, if they're slow regenerating for you, uh, it's in Zoom because they perform like absolute dreams here. Um, so one of the interesting things is whenever I show images and talk about the theory of model groups and large projects, everybody's like, well, do you actually have a giant model that we can see this <laughs> done in? Yeah, and the trouble so. is the models always belong to my clients. <laughs> so we, I mean, we could try actually, it's not too bad in Zoom. We could try um, if you reshare and do the, the video, um, enhance video, it might be okay. The only thing is sometimes it does weird things with the mouse pointer. So I, it, it, it's like a I don't even, either or. I don't even you, know how to do that. You'd, you'd have to stop sharing your screen for a quick second and then do mm. um, reshare your screen. But there's a checkbox that says enhance for video or something like that in Zoom. Optimize it's, for video yep. clip? Yep, I it. like it. I didn't so even it's know gonna, that It's going to look way better for us. The only thing is sometimes it makes your mouse a little laggy on our end. But uh, I can totally soldier. I, I work in Revit. I'm used to lag. Yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, well, so, you won't see it. We'll just see it. That's all. <laughs> I just love getting a little dig in there. So, I mean, what I want to point out about these projects, though, is these are not one-offs, okay? These are entirely built by our clients. Uh, and I want to give two shout-outs, uh, both to Niles Bolton in Atlanta, uh, who's letting us show these models. Uh, and the other one that I showed you before uh, is from Michael Graves uh, up in New Jersey. Um, and awesome. full disclosure, I have had zero parts from building any of these models. Their staff's doing it. They've learned about the group workflows. They're surviving. Nobody's dead. Everybody's okay. <laughs> um, totally doable. These are mirrored units, rotated units. So uh, they're all huge, but they perform like champs. These projects are all mostly out the door already. Um, awesome. So yeah, it's kind of fun to show those things off. So so uh, uh, I don't think anyone had the question yet, but I'm sure it's coming. So, so all the families are as far as hosting is concerned they're basically just unhosted as in level hosted right so they're hosted so level. so good so good question right actual object hosting doesn't have the same limitations so obviously all the doors are wall hosted mm -hmm. uh, and there's plenty of doors in the units and so if mm -hmm. things are door if things are wall hosted floor hosted roof hosted ceiling hosted everything is great in the groups as long as the host is also in the group mm -hmm. uh, and that's one of the other 
areas that a lot of people kind of try to break the rules and try to bend the rules with groups is they're like, well, I can put these can lights in the group, even though the ceiling is monolithic for the whole building floor and mm. I should be punched in the face. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, this one is, this one is old school, by the way, this is in Revit 18. Nice. Um, so I've been, uh, been working in 18 all week and I can't stand it. Yeah. Now I do, I, I do, uh, this is not the one that I was thinking of. I thought it was a different one, but, uh, yeah. So this one's back in 18. Um, we've got another one. Some of these are in different versions. So where's the other one that I wanted to show you? Yeah. So this one, it, this one is a lot less exciting, but the reason we have this one open is just to show that like, it's not a one-off parlor trick. So if we were to grab a unit, we want to copy it out into space somewhere. We're going to get a warning about a room because there are rooms in the units. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously now it's not bound, but even though it's not bound, it still doesn't care. We can take this thing. We can rotate it by the 90 degrees. It's not going to freak out on us. Uh, we can mirror it. Um, life is pretty good <laughs> as we know it. Um, so yeah, I mean, all that to say- Junior had a, know, actually had a really good question. I think we can probably talk about right now, yeah. which is- um, he's saying links allow him to work on a series of apartments and spread the work amongst teammates. So I guess, uh, Mike, I'll, I'll sort of interpret his as a question that I think everyone else could, could relate to, which is when it comes to work sharing multiple people working in a, in a project and then also dealing with groups, you know, what you know, sort yeah. of tips, tips are in place there. Cause obviously you, know, you can work share, but, um, you know, modifying a group, for example, with multiple people trying to modify the same group. I mean, I'm assuming that that can become an issue. Absolutely. So, and I'm going to compound that with a couple of other questions because, uh, you know, Junior's question is awesome. And also Alex has a question about what if an, an entire building has to mm -hmm. shift on site, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, even though it's boring, let's briefly pull this thing back up here, right? Because what we were talking about is, you know, there are different situations and this mm -hmm. is where absolutely, like if you want to get into what we call the combo happy meal, now you're getting into the smallest unit, the apartments definitely is groups. When there's multiple buildings on the site, absolutely make the buildings links. Mm -hmm. So, and that's where I get into like, it's not, and actually when we were joking about this webinar uh, on Twitter, Nancy, uh, actually uh, a parts a design on Twitter uh, actually brought up that, you know, it doesn't have to be one or the other. It's when do you use both? So mm -hmm. if you've got multiple buildings on a site, definitely. Um, I have what I call the butt dyno for groups, which is 20 minutes. If a group is big enough that you have to be in it more than 20 minutes, it's too big. Mm. So a floor plate, no, an apartment, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, the largest groups I have are movie theaters uh, for like, you know, when you're doing like a, you know, when I was, when I was uh, at back, they did a lot of movie theater uh, design. Mm -hmm. So you can have an entire theater room with the VOMs, the floors, the seats, the screens, the speakers, everything. And you can have detail groups attached to all of it so that the whole thing's fully annotated. Uh, bigger than that room, I wouldn't make it a group. Mm -hmm. um, and so when it comes down to like floor plates, you know, this is where the discussion gets a little nuanced. And I tell folks that we wanna be careful from not trying to over automate too many things, mm -hmm. right? So here we've got a, a large building and there are floor plates, but you'll notice that nothing is ever bigger group wise than the individual apartment. On a few projects, we'll group just the corridors and the doors and the demise mm -hmm. walls, because then we have those grouped. But yeah, you're right. Because of work sharing, you want to be able to get in and out of a group in 20 minutes, basically. <laughs> yeah, and the right. reason the reason for that is very specific. It won't let you in the group if somebody else is in it, <clears throat> right. but it hasn't checked for permissions on all the other instances of the group until you hit finish. Mm -hmm. So if you've been hanging out in a group for like two hours and then you try to finish the group and then it realizes it needs, you know, Aaron to sync with central so that you can reload latest and get a wall, you're done. You've lost mm -hmm. your group. So I always tell everybody like 20 minutes um, and then, and then it's gotta be broken up. And the other thing I tell folks is, you know, we, I think a lot of people in AEC, we like to investigate process. And so we're obsessed with this idea that I shouldn't have to do anything twice, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, we have a great app and I love this app. It's called Link Details. It has to do with drafting views, but people are always asking us like, live plan details that exist in two buildings on my garden site. I shouldn't have to draw that plan detail twice. What overly convoluted process can we make up so I don't have to draw the plan detail twice? And I'm like, it's 15 minutes. I actually think you should just draw it again. Oh, um, 
yeah, but, but no, I bring it up. Yeah, yeah. it's true. It, it's we, we, we do that with, with every, I mean, I, we have this debate all the time with detail, you know, live, live sections versus drafted sections. And, and I mean, we, we had, we had a project where it was, it was mirrored buildings and, and, mm-hmm. you know, the design team was doing everything in their power to not model both buildings. <laughs> <laughs> right right you know and, and then you find out that the basement's a little different on one and the other and so, you know is, is it really always the same you know that's that's the other yeah thing. i mean <laughs> and, and some of it you get into like i mean so the floor plate one is what comes up a lot so on a building like this we've got all the units and they're all grouped and by the way i do like to point out that they do even have groups in groups in some of these files and it's freaking glorious the bathrooms are grouped <laughs> and the kitchens are grouped inside the unit groups and everybody's like it's all gonna die and i'm like it'll be fine <laughs> um, but so then the question becomes, well, if the floor plates are all the same, shouldn't we then take all the units that are in the floor plate and then group them all into the floor plate? And like, in theory, yes, but that, that dreaded fixed groups thing that we can't stand does rear its ugly head in unforeseen circumstances. And we know that editing a group in a group does work as long as the outside group doesn't feel challenged at all. Mm-hmm. So if I, ju- if I jump in here and edit a bathroom and uh, let's see, is this the file that has one of them grouped? Yep. Here's an example. So oops, wrong group. So this one actually has groups in groups in groups, which is really cool. Um, this is not my model though. So I'm still learning my way around it. So what I was going to do is I see that like there's a sink that doesn't have join geometry done. So if I were to like go find uh, this one's like not Revit, Revit inception. It is, it is. And because I've had a few drinks now, I can't get in the group. (laughs) It's okay. Um, So if I were to do it though, right? So if I have to go into a subgroup and do join geometry or cut geometry, that's not challenging the parent group because nothing in the parent group needs to Mm re-interact. But if you've got an entire floor plate, chances are there's something in there that when you hit finish on the subgroup, it's going to want to edit it. Mm. And and that's a problem. So to me, you know, when folks tell me, well, the, the entire advantage of grouping a whole floor plate is then if I need to swap two apartment units, I just go to one and I change them. And I'm like, all right, like I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be devil's advocate here and say the building is 30 stories tall. Mm-hmm. If I have to open 30 plans and just flip two units, am I, am I really, is this really the hill we want to die on? <laughs> right. You know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. at that point, I'm like, or I just go do it. And, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. um, so. Uh, per- Pervy yeah. had a question that that's caused a couple uh, chats and I think it's probably a good one. Which is uh, when you when you're meeting uh, walls and stuff outside of the group, any tips and tricks for that? So, let's heck say yeah, good walls, question. Core, core and shell, whatever. Like what what um, in your experience, what are, what are the tips and tricks for interacting with elements outside of the group? Typically walls, Perfect. but I think there's probably other things we can think of, but definitely walls for sure. Pervy's bringing the real questions. Uh, yeah, <laughs> don't let it. Don't let them join. <laughs> um, now here's the thing. By the way, this is something like if it's me personally. I disallow join at the corners of all of my groups um, and I don't let them interact. Now, I always keep demise walls and corridors facing walls in not the group. So you'll see here, like this, this group has no demising information in it, not even the demise walls. The group basically is completely internal to everything. Mm-hmm. Um, so y- you'll even notice here, this particular architecture group does not do what, what I do, which is, oh, look, now I have to sync with central. Awesome. <laughs> Um, so me personally, I do actually right click on the blue dot and disallow join for all of my walls. It creates an ugly line for me. That's not a big deal because chances are my demise walls are rated anyway. And you see how in our template rated walls show up. Right. So I'm going to get a visual division there anyway. Mm -hmm. Um, pervy, the, the question that I, the reason I love the question is where I think it becomes a real issue is with curtain walls because they have a sneaking uh, a sneaking uh, tendency, especially because they embed in other stuff to want to move their endpoints anyway. So I always, always, always with my curtain walls set these to disallow join. I'll still let them automatically embed, but if they're set to disallow join, uh, then they don't completely go bonkers when they're touching the edges of groups. Because if there's like an interior storefront right here and it touches the exterior of the building, this will break your group almost every time. If it's set to join, because it will try to jump midway through the wall and then your host. So yeah, yeah, just set them all to disallow join. Um, to, to be fair, curtain walls at corners in general is always a pain in the ass. <laughs> so it doesn't change totally. that using groups. Um, uh, who, who has Alex asked, um, <laughs> you're grouping the rooms. And so, uh, or asking if you're grouping the rooms. And so I think that's a pretty good question for maybe it's a, folks it's who a, it's aren't, a gr- aren't used to it. It's a, it's a great question. So what we do with room objects does vary client by client. Um, 
And I'll tell you that, so a lot of our clients handle this differently. So in this one that you're looking at here, this particular client even sets all the internal walls to not room bounding because they want a single room for the mm -hmm. apartment. I, mm -hmm. I personally don't advocate that. Mm -hmm. I like to have, uh, I like to have a room in every room in the apartment. And I think this building is like that. I'm going to make a liar. I think it was one of the, one of them definitely had it. I saw when you were editing. Let's try this one. Oop, I have to activate a view, I guess, because I'm on a sheet. Where did I go? There we go. Okay, so this is more. This is more how I would do it. So to Alex's question, yes, I, I will uh, put the rooms in the group. Uh, we also use what's called the unit cloud, uh, which means there is an instance of all of the units hanging out in cringy, cringe hyperspace. <laughs> um, and that's actually in our template where all the unit documentation happens. So we don't actually create the unit plans in context in the building because in multifamily and healthcare design, a lot of times the apartments and the patient rooms are getting designed before the building's done. Right. So this is actually where all of that's ha happening. And then we just have a method to remove them from the schedule. So over here, it is important to Alex's point, you have to have something that is bounding the rooms or the groups will freak out. Mm -hmm. But hey, if you don't have the same room boundaries around all the rooms, they're not the same group. <laughs> <laughs> I go through this Valid a lot. Point. Um, Valid. I go through this a lot with hospitality <laughs> designers is they don't want, you know, they, they have, you know, room queen one but they have five different sizes for queen one so to me those are five different room types so this is interesting um, there's this this room cloud so is this mm -hmm. how are you managing uh the visibility of, of those uh are, are you are you using phasing are you using you know what are you doing to keep them out of, i know you said you're not scheduling them sure. but visibility wise i'm assuming it can be an issue for some folks so i'm curious right I'm sure so some people have the same question of how are you managing yeah. that yeah, totally. And I actually should have had our template open. So uh, I do have our template open. It's a lot, it's a lot more boring to look at. Um, but so basically what we're doing is uh, it's entirely away from the building. So we have, we have 10 scope boxes set up for a building, which exists over here. And then the entire unit cloud is off literally far, far away. So, uh, and they also do have and this is annoying. It can't be a yes or no parameter. It has to be a text parameter that is set to vary by group instance. Um, text parameters are the only ones that can vary by group instance that we can do this with, or then you can basically select everything in the unit cloud and say yes to I am unit cloud, which then removes it from any schedules and any views that you don't want to see it in. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, but you can't do it with yes or no's. I don't know why. It's and, in, and the views are using a filter? to do that? Uh, yeah, you, yeah, you could use a filter to remove them. Yeah, so we don't like to do it by phase and we don't wanna do it with design options because they are the same group that is everywhere else in the yeah. project. So yeah. if it's a phase, then they have to jump between phases and then it just gets annoying. Uh, yeah, and, and that's what I was thinking too. And, and a lot of people who may be familiar with, with uh, you know, even if they saw your, um, your template um, session, you know, how we use the future or prehistoric phases to control those mm -hmm. things, you may immediately go there. But when you're thinking the group instance, you know, then then you don't necessarily want the group objects to be in the future phase because then you're messing with the current phase. And that's I was actually curious <laughs> myself how you how you were managing that, which is which is good. It's cool. Yeah. Now, I mean, just to, just to follow up on Alex's point, there is one really interesting thing I want to touch on, and that is one of the reason I'm just going to go into blank space here so I can draw. One of the reason people love links is they say, well, I want to have a unit, and then I have a building over here that's a file, and I have a building over here, and I link in the unit, and I link in the unit, and life is awesome. And one of the downsides people say to working in groups is, well, I can have a file and I can do load as group. But then the problem is what happens when I need to update the group and the group is now in two different files, right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of folks forget that you can save groups out and you can reload a group by doing insert load as group and you can reload the group over the top of the group that is in the file. So I'm not, I'm not saying this is a great idea, but like, let's say you updated it in this file right here. You can save this group out and then open this file and do load as group and pull this back in and it will update the group. Mm. However, and Alex, thank you for this question because this is where things get dicey. We've never gotten an explanation from the Revit team on why this is. This is the one case where if the rooms are in your group, it's going to punch you in the face because everything's going to work like a champ, mm -hmm. except your room numbers just got wasted. <laughs> I have no idea why, like it doesn't waste your door numbers. It doesn't waste anything else, but your, your room numbers just got hosed if you mm -hmm. did that. But again, yeah. this is where I go back to like, how serious of a change did you make to the group? If you moved a wall, just go move it again. If you redesign the unit, I think room numbers, at least your problems. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. No, that's interesting. And, and I think, uh, I mean, my assumption is it has 
it goes back to the room objects themselves and we all know that they have some caveats in general to how they're placed and managed within the rev environment so i can see why that that would if the if the the rooms yeah <laughs> does Definitely, it, what is it yeah. does it does it re it 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 renumbers based on the last net run, uh, room so so kind of places new rooms is that what it's doing or uh i believe so yeah, yeah. yeah. That's it's what it's, I assume it's, ugly. Do. it's blowing out the rooms and putting in new rooms which means the numbers are just going to be continuing on as if you were placing rooms or something mm -hmm. but so full transparency one of these models that we had open like i said uh, this came from michael graves up in new jersey uh, they're one of our clients and they did this building and rob's actually in the chat uh hanging mm -hmm. out but this was an interesting example because this building actually had two different towers that were happening at different times mm -hmm. and they're similar, but not the same. So they were two distinct files, but the units were moving between the two files. And so I, I believe, and I'm going to paraphrase because I wasn't on the team, but I believe the approach they took was like they did one big move to like update stuff, but then like the minutia changes, they just kept doing in it both files fun. because, yeah. because it was kind of bearable. And I'm in the coordination view, which is intentionally ugly. So I don't know why I came to this view. <laughs> we'll go to a, we'll go to a better looking view um but yeah so in that case uh you know it actually worked pretty well um and actually uh allison my my wife architect uh my architect wife was on this project and she didn't kill me so it must not be that bad <laughs> i can only say that because she's not watching right now just kidding just kidding awesome um, i'm trying to read so, a ton, ton of activity on the chat which is great it's clearly a, an interesting topic for everyone so I'm, I'm trying to make sure we don't miss anything anything major here which is great um, yeah, I haven't I haven't gotten to watch the, the chat one. Much. The one thing I think someone's kind of asked, but maybe if they didn't, I have a feeling there would be some people that are curious as to um, annotating and treating tags, annotations in general. What, what tips do you have if you take the group route? The, we talked a lot about the links and the whole yeah. round robin issue of where you figure that out. As far as groups are, you, you know, in, in sort of tips for annotation, is it is it as simple as just annotate, or or I'm, I'm sure you've got some some tips and tricks. For, for that. Yeah, I mean, so uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna pull something in, and this is uh, this is just in a blank file, and this actually I, I won't do this in one of the uh, in one of the sexy files that I got from <laughs> our awesome clients. But so the nice thing about being in groups, right, is you can actually just annotate natively. You don't need to you don't need to do anything crazy. But one of the one of the most powerful things about groups that a lot of people don't remember or they forget, and this has existed at least for as long as I've been using Revit which was 8.1 in 2006, is that model groups can have attached detail groups. And the power of that is not going to show itself in your project. Mm -hmm. The power of attached detail groups is all of you who are watching, whether you're in design or architecture or engineering, your job, your career does not exist to detail freaking bathrooms. Like that is not what you should be doing. You should be designing awesome spaces handling coordination better and not having to waste time on dimensioning things and tagging things. So what I love about projects like you just looked at from NBA and from Michael Graves is they can now take units and harvest them with all the annotations. And a harvested group, what it does is it creates an actual RVT of just the model group. And then every different set of annotations that exist in every different view become a different view in that RVT file. Then what I just did a minute ago when I was off screen is I did load as group just mm -hmm. on the insert ribbon. I loaded in a bathroom mm -hmm. um, and I show this demo to, to new potential clients and we show it under the guise of this is why we want to try to get to things like standardized partition types and standardized taxonomy, uh, which was actually in your book that you wrote about how to name things and why to organize things. Mm -hmm. What a lot of people don't realize is what this means is you can save out something like a restroom. Mm -hmm. And then this was done as a model group. So it came in as a model group. And then you can actually have call outs for your enlarged plan, of course. There we go, enlarged plan. Once you have kids, you start making sound effects, by the way, with everything that you do. I'm sure you can relate now. Yeah. Oh, 100%. It's like the, the demo button is now like, <laughs> and then when we loaded this thing as group, we got this button called attach detail groups. And this thing can have everything from tags, dimensions, text, uh, keynotes, uh, detail lines, detail components, anything you want to have. And, and, you know, the whole reason I like to show this to people is if you just hit the low hanging fruit of standardize the way you want to name and classify things, and then start to work within the bounds of model groups, you can start to then harvest out of your existing projects, things that you know, you're going to either use in the future or use a similar version of in the future. 
So the bathroom might not be shaped like this, but if I place the bathroom and place the detail group and then modify the bathroom, I don't have to re-tag everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We can just kind of spend more time on coordination as you and I were talking about before the call, <laughs> which nobody wants to do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was awesome. So those are, uh, I mean, how, how the process you just showed, I mean, how, how would you explain? Yeah. Um, Cause I'm sure some people are watching that and it's a, probably a great place to end because that's an awesome moment of, of, of yeah, clarity, definitely. I think for some folks, but maybe, maybe, and, uh, maybe without digging deep into how to do that, what would yeah. you call that if people want to try that or, or actually at least do that maybe? A quick right. Break. And, and here's the thing. I don't want to, I don't want anybody to think it's a parlor trick that took an hour to set up. So we're <laughs> going to do that, it. In I was kind of teeing you up because it, it it's one of those, it, again, it's one of those things where it's like, boom, you know, awesome. So, but uh, it's so, not that difficult. <laughs> So we'll, so we'll show it in 30 seconds. So again, you know, in this particular project, the units exist in what's called the unit cloud. But so we know that if we go in this view, this is one of the instances of the model group. The only thing that has to be done for the same thing to happen with this unit is to say, I want to add annotations to this unit. Now, in this particular case, the one cleanup that you would have to do is none of these dimensions can be touching things that are outside the group. So right. for right now, just because we're in a hurry, I won't do the dimensions, but I'll do door tags. I'll do uh, room tags. Uh, I thought there was text notes, but they're room tags. So we'll just do those two things, right? So if I grab these, oh, I did it the wrong way. So if I go in the model group mm -hmm. and I say edit, you'll notice there's the paperclip button and that is attach a detail group. And I'm just going to call this group my awesome group because I'm super handy with my naming. If my Revit is slow, I have like literally 15 models open at the moment. Where's that dialogue? Revit, slow? Get out of here. <laughs> there it is, okay. So I'm gonna give it a detail group name and we're gonna call this room tags. Now you would not make a different one for room tags and door tags, I'm just doing this as a sample. So now we've made one called room tags and I'm gonna say add it, add it. Uh, and add it. And oh, there's a few more. Look at that. They've got a lot of rooms in here. There we go. And now we're done. And now if I wanted to do another one, I could do another one for the door tags and that's it. Now you just go down on the project browser, right click on the group and hit save. Mm -hmm. And it saves it out with those annotations. And what's really cool about it is you saw me over here. I placed the one that was called enlarged plan but you can save out multiple of them like we were just talking about. So there's another one called finish plan. If I place that one, a bunch of finish tags show up on the floors. And that was just another, another whole group. And so what you would do is go to your finish plan and place the finish tag group, go to your elevations and place the elevation group. And you can have, like I said, fully detailed apartments, fully detailed movie theaters. And the goal is then when you start your next job, even if it's going to be a bespoke custom apartment, you get to start with a baseline that's fully annotated, just like we did in AutoCAD. Sick. That that's that's epic right there. That's I, I know that's one of those things that I even forget about the attached thing. But but when you showed it, I was like, oh yeah, I forgot. That's awesome. It's one of those things that it's just like we don't do it very much. So I know, you forget but it's it there. Makes so you much know? sense. So so that's I think that's a great place to stop. I think anyone watching totally. this who's never seen attached details, I think you might just blow their mind. <laughs> awesome it's a good time I, I always feel bad because like whenever i show it to new people they're like did that show up in a recent version of revit and i'm like it's been around longer than i have I'm sorry no that's incredible awesome man this this has been great we could probably go on for another hour if we wanted to but uh totally. i'm sure i'm sure we'll we'll have you back on and, and who knows what we'll be talking about next um any any final words before we wrap this thing up groups <laughs> 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 Groups is the winner. <laughs> oh, for, for everybody but, who is a strong it proponent. It depends. Put it in parentheses. But <laughs> groups is the winner. Let's 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 just wrap it up like that. It's the winner. Groups, <laughs> groups for the little ones. And for anybody on the other side of the fence, I wholly respect your right to be wrong. <laughs> Fantastic. Aaron, just thank kidding, you so much. Just kidding. Uh, how can people find you? In contact uh, you, you can and, find and me yell on you for, uh, yell you for, for, for yes, not using yes. links. <laughs> exactly. Twice Roads Fool on Twitter or any social media, Aaron Maller at parallaxteam.com, HR at Parallax Team if you have a problem with something I said. <laughs> Cliff's notes, those emails come to me. No yeah, one will care. It all goes back to you, right? right. <laughs> awesome. And I'll put all the links to get, get in contact with Aaron. Thank you for coming on again, man. I knew this was going to be an awesome topic. And Definitely. I look, and I look I'll, forward to seeing the continued uh, conversation that I'm sure will happen on various social medias after this <laughs> absolutely and i'll send both of those handouts in case you want to forward them to anybody who is attending uh, awesome. there's tons awesome. of tons of fun info in there 
Awesome. And guys, thank you so much on the chat. It was a real active chat. Great questions. I appreciate it. Thanks again for Enscape for sponsoring the tip of the week. Uh, James, I, I, I got to find your email, but if, if you're here and you watch this, shoot me an email. Let me know that I read your tip and I'll, I'll send you a, a, a t-shirt. Aaron, again, thanks. Thanks for coming on. I'm sure, I'm sure we'll be seeing you again and everyone else have an awesome weekend and, uh, and I'll see you guys soon. Bye everyone. Thanks for coming. Mm -hmm.